up on Up at Noon. The Super NES Classic is cool, but we want little big Game Boy Classics. Kong Skull Island gives us hope for the Metal Gear movie. And Jumanji 2 gets a trailer. Oh boy. All that more right now on Up at Noon Live. Hey. And, that, and that's why you always have to wash your legs. Yes. We're talking oh. about having dirty legs. You interrupted. Are, are we are we doing the show? Yes, We're doing the it's show. It's a live show. But seriously, you got to clean those legs. Yeah, please, everybody clean your legs. Clean anyway, your legs. welcome to Up at Noon. It's a weird show that we do, and we have fun doing it. I'm Max Scoville. This is Brian Altano, and this is a show about, I don't know, like movies. Kindling. And kindling? Legs, Hot, legs warm and kindling. kindling. Sure, yeah, it's about goofing around with your friends and, uh, I don't know, toys and movies and video games yeah. and junk food and candy and snacks and animals and all kinds of just the nice things. The, the good the stuff. The good stuff in the world. Yeah. You know, it's a dirt, it's a dirty wreck out there. Yeah. It's disgusting. So we're gonna bring you right in here or in our nice friendship cave, and we're gonna show you all the fun treats. And we got a new Mario. He's f- friggin' gigantic. He's really huge. Look at that nose. Look at that. Great this job. is what we're doing today. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, let's get into it. Um so full disclosure, this week started off just dreadfully slow in terms mm-hmm. of any kind of news, uh, any kind of exciting stuff going on. There was a huge thing about the SNES Classic. Uh, everyone pretty much lost their minds, and then, I don't know, there wasn't any other big announcements after that. Yeah. Uh, and then a bunch of stuff started happening early this morning. First things first, uh, you might have seen this before the show officially started, the trailer for Jumanji, which right. is starring Dwayne Johnson and uh, Kevin Hart and Jack Black and Karen Gillan. Why is it called Jumanji? It's very odd. So this is actually the third Jumanji movie Technically. If you're counting Zathura. If you're counting Zathura, which yeah. I think you should because it's more of a Jumanji movie than this one looks like. Uh, the premise here is uh, pretty simple. It's it's a bunch of kids in a high school play a video game in detention because they go to a high school that forces you to clean attics in detention. And that's like the upper level of a house, not somebody who's adri- addicted to something. And then you get sucked into the video game right. and you end up there and you become your avatar. So here's the thing. First off, it, it's doesn't, a walk. it doesn't look terrible. It looks, no. It looks fun. It looks like a fun, stupid movie but, uh, that has, you know, The Rock and Kevin Hart goofing around with, with hippopotamuses. Which sure. Is, which is fine. But it also, it doesn't really look like Jumanji. It looks like just as much, like you could call this a Pitfall movie and it would be just as much of a faithful adaptation of the classic Atari game Pitfall. Uh, it's just sort of an odd, an odd choice. We're in that age now where you everything has to be a franchise, everything has to be a recognizable IP. Uh, if they were just like this movie's called Funny Monkey Games or something, or like Jungle Baloney, like people probably wouldn't go see it. Right. But the fact that it's called Jumanji and the fact that it's like it's it's a retro video game. They're it's kind also of going not. On this. It's not a retro video game because like look at the font work on this. Team. Yeah. Like right off the bat, it's like come on, man, get the basic stuff down. So, yeah, we're at a point now where. I don't think it's excusable for video games to be, like, inaccurately represented in movies. Like, everyone plays video games now. Like, video games are a mainstream thing. So for them to, like, you know, I don't know, screw up a weird detail, like, oh, like, what the graphics look like. It just, it's just laziness on the part of the filmmakers. But that being said, uh, yeah, this looks interesting. I like that they immediately kind of address the fact that, like, everyone was like, oh, why does Karen Gillan wear skimpy clothing? And she's like, oh, because she's a video game character. Right. So and, yeah, and she calls it out. Yeah. Uh, no, I think you're right. Like, this is, uh, you know, effectively a video game movie, which right. I don't think any of us really understood that that's what it was going to be. But my issue with this is, A, like we said earlier, um, you know, just make a new thing. Not everything sure. has to be named after something else. It, it's also like there's not, I don't think there's enough brand recognition with something like this to go, oh, we have an idea for this film. We're going to name it after this other thing. It's not connected enough to the other thing. You know, like, then then who is it for, really? Right. The other thing that's really annoying me is that Jumanji is an interesting premise because it takes things that are not supposed to be there and puts them where they're not supposed to be, such as, I don't know, a rhino in your kitchen or monkeys taking over your living room. Seeing a rhino in the jungle is not interesting because that's where they go. Right, I mean, the, I think their logic here is that they took people who don't belong in this situation and they, they put them there. I mean, the whole the expression "fish out of water" is it's a fun concept because a fish out of water is 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 cruel and funny. Right. But if you just put a person in water, that's less I- interesting. Yeah. You know? yeah exactly. I guess like cat and water comedy is what you'd call. It. I don't know. It's like the opposite of fish out of water. Uh, but that being said, I mean, it's going to be a bunch of CG animals. It's probably going to be a good time. Uh, yeah. Where's, where's David Allen Greer as the cop? 
This is what we're missing here. Every movie needs David Allen Greer as a cop showing up and being like, what's going on here? But that's not happening here because yeah. he would just be like, oh, that's a normal jungle with normal jungle things happening. Yeah. Anyway, do yourself a favor and go watch the original Jumanji. Yeah. Uh, this comes out in Christmas time. Uh, yeah, it looks fine. It's just, again, it's like one of those weird like, all right, that's, that's a thing we're having now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So speaking of things that don't look great, I'm just going to say it. The Inhumans TV show looks real, real awful. It looks very not good. And I know it's a two-minute trailer. How much can you glean from that? Well, well let's, enough let's to, take a look. I mean, enough so, to put yourself into you know, a 12-episode yeah. show, So right? this is ABC's putting this out. This is kind of joining the ranks of uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and all that. And, uh, and it's it's the Inhumans who are a bunch of, like, they're, they're like, sort of myth, mythical mutants of the Marvel Universe. They've always been almost kind of like a like a sort of... They're, they're like a somewhere between Thor and the X-Men. And someone in the comments is going to be mad that I said that. But they've got the kind of the more the more fantastical side. It's not just like, yep. oh, they're mutations. Uh, but again, there's that they look, weird... They look like yeah. me watching the trailer. There's that, <laughs> there's that weird gray area of, uh, you know, Marvel can't do stuff with, uh, with the X-Men on TV. So this is sort of in the proper MCU. Uh, and... It just looks like a sci-fi channel show. It looks very it looks very low budget and they're boasting the fact that it's being shot on IMAX and they're going to be showing it in IMAX. This is a TV show, like a network TV show that's going to be premiering in IMAX theaters. This starts on uh, in select theaters on September 1st and then the the show properly premieres on TV on right. the 29th. Uh, what was that? I mean, so that's Lockjaw and Black. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, what was the CG on that? I understood what we saw. I mean, I'm, like, whatever it is. I will I will be forgiving of a teleporting dog CG used in a, a network TV show. Like, See, I, 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 I won't. Because, okay. like, to me, it's like, if you're not going to make something look interesting, also, then don't attempt just to get do a, it to begin like, with. Just get a huge dog and put, like, a little tuning fork in his head. It's so this, like, all of this stuff so, feels like, this right. feels like uh, so, when you see a guy on Chopped. Right. And he's like, okay, uh, like, you have to make dinner, but you only have these ingredients. Like, they obviously can't make the X-Men TV show they want to make, so we're getting this well, weird version so, instead. So, no, what's, what's really just really crappy here is that they're, like, boasting the fact that it's all shot on IMAX, that's great. If the costumes look like that, it doesn't matter what resolution or how big the screen is or what kind of cameras you're using, it's still gonna look like crap. Oh, and by the way, the showrunner's the guy who did Iron Fist and the later half of Dexter, so. Yeah, uh, by the way, when that guy was working on Iron Fist, like he very openly said, hey, uh, right before we started shooting, I had to Google how to do fight choreography. Not a good look. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you uh, stuck around for the last two or three seasons of Dexter, I'm sorry. We're gluttons for punishment. I was there with you yeah. right up to the very end, which I won't spoil, but it's bad. Uh, you know that maybe this is not in, in the best hands. So you take like kind of watered down X-Men because yeah, you can't sure. legally use the real ones and you put it in the hands of people who maybe haven't made the best TV and then you put it on ABC, a channel where it's like you can't really get well, away with that It's much. also like we're at a point now where... Um, I don't know, like, we've got really good superhero movies. They're great. Mm -hmm. They're doing just fine. Marvel has it down to a science, and to the point that things are so kind of predictably good that people are like, this is really, this is, it's it's very pleasant, and I enjoy the films, and I see all of them, but when are they going to really kick it in the ass and do something exciting? Uh, the TV shows, I don't watch them. They're like, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was always kind of like a loose concept. People loved it. Some people really enjoyed it. But that was also, like, that had the, the luxury of being like, oh, it's sort of like, it's set in an office. It's kind of a, a, a crime procedural to a certain degree. Yeah. This is like, this is big budget. This is big characters. This is proper super people running around and doing super stuff. And it just looks, it looks tacky. It I, looks, also, I also uh, only needed to see Ramsey Bolton from Game of Thrones fight yeah. dogs once. Anyway, so. And that was there yeah. and it was perfect. If you're excited about Inhumans, that's great. I'm happy for you. That's, I don't know. It just, I, we, we can have nicer things. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's, yeah. Go watch the go watch the generation Generation X pilot that Fox put out in 1994, and compare that to what we're getting within humans, and be like, has it been 25 years? I think it has. So it I think I think like the solution is like if you want to make a comic book show that isn't just like cheap campy nonsense, it's got to go in the right place. Like yeah. you've got to put it on HBO, you got to put it on AMC, or you got to put it on Netflix. You have to be, put it in a place where you can actually take some risks. Yeah, I mean we're getting stuff like Legion and Preacher and Walking Dead that are all like doing really like very smart things with comic books and they have like gorgeous use of budget and it's just like why don't, why don't we have why why can't we have yeah. that with the Marvel stuff? But let's focus on the good yeah. because That's the good Marvel stuff. Apparently, Marvel stuff. yep, there is there is an amazing no pun intended movie coming out very very soon called Spider-Man: Homecoming. Yeah, reviews are trickling in as of this morning. Yep. Uh, 
and it looks good. This yeah, might be our so, first good Spider-Man so movie in a very is, long time. This was a, a weird one going into because it's obviously it's a partnership between Marvel and, and Sony, and we've had some so-so Spider-Man movies in the past. We've had some bad ones, yeah. to be honest. Uh, and this is the first time it's it's Spidey being done right. We loved him in Civil War. He, Tom Holland is fantastic, but this is kind of like a weird. It's a weird collaboration. We're like, is is Sony going to be calling weird shots here? Is Marvel handling all of it? The trailers have been, uh, I would say, they've shown way too much, but apparently they haven't shown a whole lot because yeah. uh, the reviews are out and they're, they sound really enthusiastic, and I'm incredibly relieved. We're cu currently looking at a 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. And that's, that's going to fluctuate. That's, that's going to go up and down. Yeah. Uh, Wonder Woman seems to have settled at a 92, so... That means the last two comic book movies have been pretty damn good. And that's, yeah. that's and so, on both sides of the fence, so you can't yeah. even get into the Marvel DC show. Yeah, exactly. And that's good. That's good for yeah. everybody. Um, but let's take a look at some of the quotes from these from these reviews. Uh, right off the bat, Rolling Stone says, Newsflash, Tom Holland is the best movie Spider-Man ever. He finds the kid inside them a famous red onesie and brings out the kid in even the most hardened film goer. That rules. That's awesome. And yeah. like, I mean, it's it's Peter Travers, Rolling Stone. He's a, he's a great film critic. Uh, he's also, I mean, at this point, he's not the kind of, he's not going to get like fanboy hyped up, but... If it's like, oh, yeah, Spider-Man made me feel like a kid again, that's good. Uh, USA Today, the I mean, they're kind of a daily bugle in their own sense, but they say the magic of Homecoming is that it belongs more to the John Hughes cinematic universe than the Avengers. That is something that makes me incredibly excited because I've always liked the side of Spider-Man that he's a kid in high school. He's dealing with, you know, like teen problems. He's got like, you know, it's, it's, it's teen comedy stuff. Like, I like that. And then you throw in a guy who's got like cybernetic vulture wings and it gets... And Very I think that's so. like tremendously important when you're talking about Spider-Man as a character, uh, especially as, as as a movie. You hear a lot of like, oh, I want the fights to be good, or who's the villains? Like, that's really important. How does it tie into the rest of the MCU? What you never really hear about is like, how's the writing? Like the writing is tremendously important for Spider-Man yeah. because yeah. he walks a very thin line between just being the hokiest, corniest dude in the world like Spider-Man swings into stores and all that, or having one-liners that are like legitimately yeah. heartwarming. Also, I don't know, like the his whole his whole dual life is the most relatable. That's always been Spider-Man's number one appeal is that, you know, he's like he goes home and he's got like a he's got an aunt, he's he's kind of poor, he gets bullied at school and then he goes out and fights. It's like when when you know, Batman takes off the the cape and cowl, he's a billionaire. Yeah. You know, Tony Stark parties and works on his hot rods. It's like Spider-Man, there's actually something there to, to focus on. So, anyway, um, IndieWire says, Marvel has finally started to figure out what the future of superhero movies might look like. I mean, if they hadn't already, I, th I think at this point we're kind of ask asking what, what next. Uh, mm -hmm. And we know that Spider-Man's going to be in Infinity War, so if he's showing up and it's just, if th this, this is very promising. I'm very, I'm very excited about it. Uh, and also, you know, I mean, between this and like Black Panther and, and Thor Ragnarok, it's about time they started kind of shaking things up a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree. Oh, here's a wall of text. Collider says, Homecoming takes Peter Parker in a fresh direction, not only by investing in his teenage world rather than using it as a backdrop, but by letting him run toward being Spider-Man rather than wrestle with the weight of his responsibilities. This is awesome. I love this. Uh, the fact that Spider-Man wants to be Spider-Man and have fun is such a nice change of pace from what we've seen beaten to death in the last two trilogies, where uh, with Tobey Maguire, as of like the second movie, I mean, at the end of the first one, he's like, this is my gift, this is my curse. I was like, yeah, dude, but like, you know, maybe have fun with it a little bit. Yeah. You, know, you get spider powers. And then Andrew Garfield was like, those are some like legitimately like pretty, pretty dark movies. And I think they were kind of going after that, uh, that sort of, that, that Batman darkness, that grittiness that was so huge. But we're at a point where like, you can get the gritty stuff too, but like, Let's try. Let's have Spider-Man. I be totally a, agree. I mean, a wise I crack and as, as an audience member, you're like, I can't do what he does because it's highly athletic, and I want to go through escapism and be like, I'm him. I I can be depressed at home. I don't need to watch a movie for that. I can do that for free. Yeah, save twelve bucks. Uh, Cinema Blend says Spider-Man: Homecoming gets it right. It is my favorite Marvel Cinematic Universe movie. Uh, obviously, walking out of a movie, you're going to have some very special, exciting feelings, and that's, you know, it, I'm sure people are going to, six months from now, be like, here are things that didn't work in that film right. once the dust settles. But, like, I don't know, to, to walk out of there and be like, I love Spider-Man. Like, Spider-Man is, he's, like, he's, uh, screw it, he's the best Marvel character. He's, like, he's he's their Batman. He's he's the one who everyone, like, everyone knows Spider-Man. Spider-Man's great. Wolverine's cool, too, but Spider-Man's the best. Mm -hmm. And we haven't gotten, like, a proper Marvel treatment of him really ever. So if this is that chance, then... Hell yeah. It's I, also like if you trace back, do you remember a couple years ago when we like it was like a, a rent, it was like a Thursday night. We got the announcement that like Sony was partnering with Marvel on selling the rights for the movie. Mm -hmm. And immediately a million questions went in the air, and now they're finally being answered. And it's like, oh no, it's it's okay. We don't know where it's gonna go from here. We don't know what the Venom vs. Carnage vs. Sinister Six movie without Spider-Man is, or maybe Tom Holland will walk through the Let's back. Let's deal with that later. Let's well, just yeah. enjoy the But right nice. now, things are nice. Yeah, let's just relish it. Yeah. Uh 
I love this. Uh, is that the same? That's the same one with larger text. I don't know why I did that. Look at that. Just look at, check it out. Want to see that? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> oh. Oh. Also, I like that this was a quick Photoshop job because clearly, if you've ever seen a newspaper, I don't know. You're watching this streaming on the internet. Maybe you haven't. They don't look like that. That's not what a good newspaper looks like. They will now. Anyway, in 2017. Uh, <laughs> Polygon, those uh, those wordsmiths over there, they put a bunch of words here. They say, Spider-Man Homecoming is smart, incredibly funny, and surprisingly clever. It is an entirely unexpected, perhaps even vanishly implausible, fresh start for the third Spider-Man franchise of the past 15 years. What they're saying there is, this is great. Don't screw it up. So, Sony, I hope you're listening. Marvel, keep it up. Uh, and then, of course, it can't all be, you know, sunshine and flowers. The Hollywood Reporter... Those, uh, those old muckrakers, they <laughs> hang in there, true believers. Maybe we'll get it better the second time around. Ooh. So, you know, uh, okay. you know there, were, there were like a couple sort of negative reviews. I think, you know, the fact that this many critics can walk out of a superhero movie in 2017 and be like, yeah, it's doing something new, it's fun, it's entertaining, is, that's a testament to either what this movie is doing or the fact that Spider-Man's great. So, like, I don't know, you're probably going to go see Spider-Man because Spider-Man's awesome and going to see Spider-Man movies, even when they suck, is still a great time. So. Yeah. Yeah, Spider-Man. 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 Swings in a theater soon, as yeah. they say when they don't know how to write well. Thwip. <laughs> uh, we got awesome news this week uh, that tickled your nostalgia and also has probably had you refreshing every stupid online retailer in the world. Because with great power comes great responsibility from Nintendo. Uh, the SNES Classic. Uh, it's basically a micro Super Nintendo with 21 games on it. A bunch of them third party, a bunch of them first. Uh, 80 bucks, two controllers, launches this September. Um, some of the greatest games of all time, undeniably, are packed into this thing. Now, immediately, you probably said to yourself, that's great. And then you went through that vicious cycle of Nintendo stuff, which some of you are still going through with Switch, where you realize you can't buy it. And then you set up like some sort of like a push notification thing on your phone. So I, yeah, uh, I'm your not phone buzzes be... in the middle of the night and it's still not yeah. what you want it to be. I'm not going to be happy until I have one of these in my hands yes. and it's mine. Like yeah. it's kind of the same feeling I had with like surrounding Switch stuff. Like mm -hmm. I had the whole weird thing where I pre-ordered that and then Amazon sent it to like some warehouse someplace and a guy was kicking the box around until I like called him on the phone. And, like, that was a tough weekend. That was I, not great. No. Also like... Uh, we know there are bigger problems out there. Uh, yeah, still, we, I have we grand, the I, my grandfather was in the war or whatever. Yeah. But like, yeah, that was a tough weekend for me. I wanted yeah. my switch. So like, oh, let's just assume, just look, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that there will be enough for everybody. Everyone's going to be able to get their hands on one, and the cord will be able to reach you from the. From so it. they did specifically say the cord would be five feet now instead of three. Uh, if you remember, the three foot cord was enough to do nothing except for standing in front of your TV like you were three. Uh, and also, there's going to be more of them out in the wild. Officially, uh, they sort of ceased production uh, on the NES Classic to ramp up production on the Super NES. So there's a chance that we'll get more of these, but there's also a bigger chance that uh, a bunch of like spam bots from Singapore will pre-order 50,000 of them, put them all on eBay for yeah. $400 a piece, and we're screwed. But that said, it's a nice idea, yes. it's great. I'm really excited about this. I've always been more of a Super Nintendo kid than uh, an NES kid, just because yep. of age and whatnot. These look great, they're wonderful, but of course, we're greedy little pig boys and we want more. <laughs> we want Nintendo to do more things like this, so we're already thinking ahead. What do they do next? Obviously, you could say N64. That mm -hmm. gets tricky because you're getting into, first of all, some some hit or miss games there. Yeah, uh, and they're also more complex and a weird controller that's going to be yeah. There's hard a, I, to... I, I would say the the highs of the N64, uh, are, you know, are are worth visiting. Mm -hmm. The the it, it gets very low. Uh, it, that's the you know the dawn of 3D gaming. Yeah, to, they were to an they extent. were doing some some strange things yeah. there. But the other thing they could do, and this is a great idea is go into the old Game Boy. That's right. So we started, you know, screwing around in Photoshop and sort of just, this is this is what we want. This is what we want in a, a number of different forms. Yeah. Let's start with the Game Boy Classic. Wouldn't Ooh. this be a nice little treat? I'm totally like, into this. I like the idea, like imagine if you will, dear dear viewers, uh, it's got a backlit screen, like yep. a nice little Indiglo thing. It's maybe clearer like the uh, like the game the Game Boy Pocket had. Uh, but you know, it's 2017, so of course it's rechargeable with a USB plug. And it's, it, you don't have to get AA batteries every 20 minutes. Oh, and, and maybe, you know, it would have, it would have like, a whole bunch of games built in. Like, oh, I don't know, all of these. Look at this library. Yeah. The original so let's go Game through Boy, this real yeah. quick, because this is like, the original Game, Game Boy, I don't think people remember, has an incredible library. Uh, and it took a minute for them to get it right. You know, Metroid 2 is a little weird, and Super Mario Land is the weirdest Super Mario game. But uh, look, Super Mario Land, Mario Land 2, Pokemon Red and Blue and Yellow, Metroid 2, Donkey Kong, which is, you guys are sleeping on Donkey Kong. If you haven't played that game, that is a 
perfect video game. Tetris, obviously, uh, Link's Awakening, my personal favorite video game of all time. Then let's get into some third party stuff, stuff like TMNT, Fall of the Foot Clan, uh, Mega Man 5. Now, a bunch of the Mega Man games were ported to the Game Boy, but they were sort of weird remix truncated versions. Five's the first one that just perfectly nailed it. Uh, Kid Icarus is not great, but I really like it. Um, Final Fantasy Adventure is a fantastic sort of top-down action RPG. Uh, Kirby's Dream Land, again, the, the original. Oh, yeah, I love perfect. that Perfect. Gargoyle's Quest, which is great. It's kind of a spinoff of Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Uh, Castlevania 2, that's the one that kind of got it right. Donkey Kong Land's a weird one. It's aged strange. What about Wario Land? Wario Land. He's in there. He's in there. You Don't skipped worry. right over. You went we're, we're getting there. We're getting oh, there. Uh, and then Alleyway, Ninja Gaiden Shadow, and uh, Mario's P Picross. So I think that, you know, you could also throw in Dr. Mario in here. There's a whole, I'm missing bun a bunch of them, right? A good mix of action games, platforming games, RPGs, and of course puzzle games, which I think the Game Boy was most known for. And I like the idea of having different sort of like settings in the back of it. You can yeah. play in black and white. So, you can play in yeah. puke, puke green. So the coolest thing I think about the NES, Super NES Classic is that looking at the NES Classic, a lot of that I think is stuff that, that Nintendo had like full control of, but yeah. with the Super NES, it started getting into more third-party stuff. The fact that Castlevania is on there is a huge, and and uh, and of course uh, Super Mario RPG, which was developed with SquareSoft. Yep. That's like one; they're not afraid to deal with like with some third-party stuff and put some. You know, I don't know if they call people up and they're like, "Hey, can we use this old game you're not doing anything with?" And they're like, "Sure, go nuts." Uh, and then also having huge RPGs on there, like having just large games. They're not just being like, here's like casual fun stuff. Having something you can really sink a bunch of time into is, is an awesome idea. Yeah, I mean, Link's Awakening is a game I put like 35 hours into as a kid, and it was the first time I ever thought that you could take an adventure that big and put it onto something that small and bring it anywhere. Yeah. I mean, I went on like car trips and vacations with my family to the beach where they would all wake up and go down and put on sun, sun, suntan lotion and all that, and I would just stay home and play video games. Yeah. And look at me now. Now just imagine if you could get and the, you could get like just like a little rechargeable Game Boy that has a Pokemon on it, and maybe there's like a, a peripheral you get that's like a that's like a Game Link cable. Mm -hmm. and your friends can do that. I mean, like obviously we all have switches and Max. I, lo I, I love it. I love it. I'm right. going to be totally honest with you. It, it is missing one thing: color. Yep. And that's where the Game Boy Color Classic comes in. Look at this that thing. beauty right here. Yeah, you get this. I like back when the Game Boy Color came out. They were like, well, we can have color or a light. And then you look over at the Game Gear, and they're like, no, we're not doing that. So they were like, here's a color screen that you have to like hold in direct sunlight, which I love now if this direct sunlight hits your switch, you're like, what am I looking at? I can't see a damn thing. Uh, yeah, let's just take it, shrink it down, make it real tiny, do the same thing we just suggested. USB port charging, rechargeable battery, beautiful little screen. Put a whole bunch of games in there. Oh, I don't know, which games? Maybe these games. Oh! What are those games? Well, let's oh, start with games. Super Mario Brothers DX. It's weird because it's sort of pan and scan version of the original Mario, but it's got tons of cool unlockables. It hooks up to the Game Boy printer, which probably won't work anymore. Uh, we got if Zelda. If their next thing is a Game Boy printer classic, I'll yep. be like, what? Then we have three damn near perfect Zelda games. Uh, Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, and Zelda Link's Awakening DX, which has a new color dungeon, which isn't very good, but the entire game is colored, it's awesome. Uh, Donkey Kong Country, this is the first time that game was ever made portable. Uh, I'd again port it to the Game Boy Advance later, but it's so cool here. R-Type DX, another just classic shmup. If you've never played this one, it's pretty much perfect. Kirby Tilt and Tumble, okay, things get a little weird because there's a lot of like gyroscope stuff that goes on the, on the gyroscope? Game Boy. Gyroscope? Gyroscopes? <laughs> uh, so, that's a hero. Scope. A gyroscope. Uh, then we've got Metal Gear Solid, which, yes. um, so, first of all, one of the first games that IGN ever gave a 10 to. That's second of all, one of the hardest games to buy boxed complete. It's incredibly rare. I mean, it's it was it's weird that that's E-rated. I guess you couldn't really put a lot of blood on that little tiny yeah. screen. But that was a that's a that's Ghost Babel. That's a Metal Gear game, dude. It's this got, that is like a perfect top-down Metal Gear game. Yeah. I think it's the so, best top-down. Yeah, Metal the Gear fact game. that you've got uh, Castlevania 3 on the Super NES Classic gives yeah. me a ton of hope that we if we ever see a Game Boy Color Pocket Classic, whatever the hell they're calling it, that we get this on there. Yeah. So then we've got Pokemon Pinball, which is a fantastic pinball game. Obviously, Nintendo's made a lot of pinball games to varying degrees of success. Mario Pinball on the GBA was not good. Metroid Prime Pinball is pretty cool. Pokemon Pinball is awesome. Uh, then we've got two Pokemon games over here, Silver and Gold, so you can do your trading. Tetris DX, which is basically uh, a remake of the original, but with rocket ships. Um, Wario Land 3. I love again, that one. Kind of perfect platform. That's the game. one where you can't die. You just get like weird disorders and yeah, stuff. Yeah, you just get like sick. But yeah, it's you get fun. like you start throwing <laughs> up or you catch fire and you wind up like three screens back and you're like, what was that? Yep. Uh, Dragon Warrior 3, which is uh, again just a fantastic top-down RPG. Pokemon trading card game, which I think people have been wanting. Now here's the thing: you're gonna have to make some concessions here and some updates. This is gonna have to work wirelessly for trading for a bunch of other games, right? Yeah. It, they'll have to be the first of the classic line here to communicate with. I each mean, that's other. what I was saying just a minute ago. Is like. I, 
maybe you just, if this thing is, if this, if this fictional device that we are literally just wishing existed, if it did in fact have a USB port, it could also have an IR thing like the, like the Game Boy Color did. Yeah. Or maybe just a little USB cord that you plug into your friend's, your friend's game. Now, keep in mind, Nintendo has actually updated some of these classic virtual console games to work on 3DS, such as the Pokemons, and they had it so there's wireless connectivity between them, and you don't need link cables and all that. Uh, let's pull up that screen and just go through the last few of these classic games here. I threw in some extra ones, uh, Mega Man Extreme, Bubble Bobble, Shantae, Mario Golf, Mario Tennis, and GTA 2, which God, I think they... a, a lot of people forget is yeah. even on if that system. If they put GTA 2 on, a, on, it would be so much fun. That game is, is so, like, weird. It feels like, it feels, I would say, almost as much like a Lego game as it does a GTA game. Yeah. Compared to what it is now. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Good times. So yeah, that's all great. That's awesome. But maybe you grew up in the 16-bit era and you want uh, your games to be a little bit more wide than square. Yeah, maybe you're a mature gamer who needs really weird print advertisements with people's feet in them. Maybe. That's what the Game Boy Advance is here for. So yeah, shrink that down too. We already got the Game Boy Micro, which is one of my favorite handhelds ever. Yep. Uh, just make that, but make it atomic purple with the weird, with the round sides and, and you know, again, all the stuff we just said. I like those big buttons you gave look it. Look at the big buttons. That'd be so, be so nice, little big buttons. I like big buttons and I, I cannot lie. I like big, <laughs> yeah, anyway. Well, let's uh, get into the library. Yeah. This is a really tough one to, to oh, narrow yeah. down. Because like, really, honestly, you're looking at this image and right off the bat you're saying, you didn't put in something else, right? Yeah. So let's go through. Uh, there were two Metroid games on the system, uh, Fusion and Zero Mission. One's original, one's a remake. They're both pretty much fantastic. Uh, Zero Mission is infinitely better, though. Uh, Zelda Minish Cap, which was made by Capcom. Yep. It's the only original Zelda game on the system, but it's so good. Max, this is that's, one of your favorite that's games. That's one of my favorite games, period. That's like, I would... I know it's not right, but that's like neck and neck with Link to the Past for yeah. me. I love that game so much. Uh, maybe you like your RPGs to be a little more Mario and Luigi infused. So we got Mario and Luigi over here. Uh, there were three GBA Castlevania games. Uh, they all worked pretty much in different varying degrees of success. Yeah, but uh, it's well, inarguable. It was like it was like. Circle of the Moon, Harmony of Dissonance, and Area of Sorrow. So I put two of them on there. You could put all three if you yeah. wanted. Circle of the Moon Again. was really dark on launch hardware, but... I remember that was that was the first game I remember seeing on a Game Boy Advance, and yep. I was just like, like looking at it, I was like, oh my god, they did it. Do you remember hearing it? Yeah. It did that, like, it did that thing at the beginning, it was like, ah, 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 ah. it had like Gregorian chants. Yeah. And you're like, this is coming from the power of my hands. <laughs> Honestly, I don't think, yeah, I think seeing a Game Boy Advance for the first time was one of those like, holy crap moments like up there with playing yeah. like Mario 64 for the first time of just like, they did it. It works. Kinda. It didn't work in the sun or anywhere in the dark. You well, I was, I was light, actually, but. I think I was like between sun. I was like in like a bedroom or something. <laughs> I don't know, it was a weird place. Uh, so know. yeah, let's look at the rest of these games because they're so yeah. damn awesome. Um, okay, Final Fantasy Tactics. A lot of you guys love that game. I never got super into it, but I understand why it should be here. Golden Sun, you can put both of those games on there. Oh, yeah. They're really awesome. Mario Kart Super Circuit. Uh, Mario 3. Now, here's the thing. like They put a bunch of classic NES Mario games on here and Super NES. Uh, so you can take any of them. Mario 2 is on here. Mario 3. Mario World. Yoshi's Island. Um, Pokemon. Fire Red. Emerald. Uh, there's a whole bunch of great Pokemon or, games. Or what is it? Like Ruby... Ruby, Sad, yeah, there's Sad, so many. I, yeah, uh, Wario Land Four, another game where he kind of gets sick, but it's cool. I love Wario. Uh, <laughs> Advance wow. Wars, that's the, the one, dude. The best strategy, the best yeah. top-down strategy. Mean, that's ever why made. I put that there. That's yeah. the one that people it's want. So damn so. good. It's amazing that they haven't really made a new one recently. Uh, Kirby, there's tons of great Kirby games on the GBA. WarioWare, just one of the most perfect games ever made. Hell yeah. Uh, then we got the Castlevanias. Astro Boy, I don't know if you guys have played this one, but Astro Boy and Ninja 5 are two games I put on there that are really, really awesome. Astro Boy is developed by Treasure. Uh, just really fantastic sort of platforming shmup, shmup game. Um, check those out if you haven't. Uh, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, Super Mario World. Zelda, A Link to the Frickin' Past is on yeah, the system. Yeah, you gotta have that. Like, throw that in there. Yeah, Final Fantasy 1 and 2. Mario Golf and Fire Emblem. There you and go. again, like, we're missing dozens of great games. Oh, look at us. And you can put you can put us on there oh, too. Oh look at that! Oh yeah. man, I would totally watch this. That would be awesome. GBA. Yeah, we'd have to put like a ten minute clip of our show on like one cartridge. I had like a I had a Game Boy Advance cartridge that had like half an episode of Dragon Ball GT. Oh dude, the Nickelodeon actually partnered with uh, I believe it was Nintendo at the time, and they put a whole bunch of cartoons on the GBA that you could buy on so fat weird. little cartridges and plug in. They had like Ninja Turtles episodes and stuff. Yeah, they like were that. like they were like real player at like one kilobyte a second or something. So the weird thing too is if you uh, download an entire ROM set, which you shouldn't because it's piracy, but I don't care either. Uh, <laughs> a bunch of the games in there are old cartoons, but like they're like really ripped like low poly YouTube FMVs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good no, time I love that. Um, 
So yeah, uh, these are our, our weird wishes of demands of lists of the, I don't know what sentence that was, but yeah, uh, after the SNES Classic comes out and we complain about the cord being too short, maybe Nintendo should release some little classic things that have no cords whatsoever. Yep. Just put them in your pocket and go, go about your business. Go I'm on some road trips, go play it at the library, put it behind a, a textbook, pretend you're working. <sighs> All right. So moving on, um, you might have seen in the headline of this episode, uh, the Metal Gear movie. We have no news about it, so if you're looking for it, I apologize. However, I finally got around to watching Kong Skull Island, which, if you're not paying attention, was directed by Jordan Vote roberts who is the guy who is... I, th- I don't even, I, he's, I think he's attached to the Metal Gear movie. He's been hanging out with Kojima left and right. They were at, they were at E3 together. He's got this huge beard. He's really, seems like a really cool guy. I follow him on Instagram. Um, but yeah, the uh, Kong Skull Island, uh, if you look at it, if you skipped on it like I did, it's really, really fun. It's also surprisingly weird. Yeah. Uh, it's got a lot of, I mean, it does, it, it, they kind of tell you what's going on. Mm-hmm. It's just the island. There's none of that stuff where Kong goes to New York. Uh, so it's a bunch of like Vietnam era, like special forces guys and scientists and they go to this island and there's like big spiders and there's funny pterodactyl things. And It's just a really uh, fun, goofy monster movie. Yeah. Like, we don't get enough of those. It's, on, it's streaming on demand now if you missed it in theaters like we did. Uh, both of us just watched it this week. It's gorgeous. It's fun. It's stupid. It's got heart. Yeah, uh, I think a bunch it, of idiots die in it and it's fun to watch them get killed because they're stupid. Yeah. Now what you ask, what does, this have you to, what does this have to do with Metal Gear, which is of course tactical espionage absolutely action it's a it's a world of, of military espionage fiction historical fiction and of course mechs big old mechs what does that have to do with the movie with the monkey well the the since uh, i would say metal gear solid the the metal gear has always been presented as kind of a kaiju the metal uh, gear. and they they double down on that with uh, with metal gear ray which screamed for no apparent reason i don't know why you make a big robot that jumps in water and has like weird funny flippers and it screams but they do, uh, and watching how Jordan Vote Roberts handles a camera with this giant, terrifying thing that's smashing helicopters and doing the kind of stuff that really, it, yes, it might be a large gorilla, but pretend it's a robot. Watch yeah. that movie and be like, this could work. Um, what I think is really cool, though, is he does some very, like, very overly stylized things with the camera. Uh, I pulled a couple shots here, just side by side, shots of King Kong and then some Yoji Shinkawa illustrations from you know Metal Gear concept art. Uh, just these shots that are like, they're they're almost. Let's get that lower third out of there so you can you can see the little tiny lady. Can we move that there? There. Thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, like that shot in the movie is of course I I cropped it, but it's like it's very symmetrical. It's very stylized. It doesn't really it doesn't really look like uh, you know cinema verite or anything. And then these shots where Samuel L. Jackson is like staring down King Kong, and it just had me thinking like this is. The kind of like this is the kind of like just hyper stylized stuff that that looks like Metal Gear art, right. and of course you know Kojima's always leaned very heavily into doing things that are very cinematic and sort of sort of grounded and realistic. But at the same times, you do have like invisible cyborg ninjas and and sexy wolf adopting women with sniper rifles. So like, if this guy's doing stuff that looks kind of akin to the concept art, and he, there's also a scene where Tom Hiddleston. Uh, is he grabs a katana and puts on a gas mask and goes running through a cloud of green smoke. And he looks like up, Psycho Mantis? Yeah, yeah chopping up a bunch of pterodactyls that are filled with blue blood. I was watching it and I'm like, what What did I eat before I watched this? Like, right. it's, It gets very weird, very surreal. Um, I just, I think the dude might have what it takes to make like a cool looking Metal Gear movie. Also, uh, no matter what he does, people are going to find tons of problems with it. Maybe what we need for a Metal Gear movie is something that just looks at the nuts and bolts where it's uh, totally bizarre Saturday morning cartoons that also have PTSD and they're fighting big robot stuff. It's effectively M-rated G.I. Joe Real American Hero but filtered through the eyes of a Japanese dude who loves American cinema. So I don't know what Jordan Vote Roberts is going to do with it, but after seeing Kong Skull Island, I'm... Uh, Cautiously optimistic. So. Yeah, I think people are doing this thing where they're lumping in anything with the words Metal Gear into Konami's business practices right now. And that not, doesn't necessarily ring true or drag its like dead carcass over towards the movie. Because I think the movie has strength enough to be its own thing, separate from the franchise that, or wherever that's going in Konami's hand and the pachinko machines and stuff like that. But I think that this could be a really cool thing. And at the very, at the very least, like it's going to be gorgeous looking and, and fun, right? 
Like yeah. maybe it won't nail every story beat that some of the most obsessed Metal Gear fans out there expect because it does have to tread the line carefully. Yeah. And sort of, you know, take people like me who played a bunch of Metal Gear games but couldn't string together the plot cohesively if they were paid. Yeah, also, like, if you if you dig into Metal Gear, it's pretty much just cool remixes of existing movies and stuff. Uh, you know, you get Apocalypse Now, you get The Rock, you get Escape from New York. There's a bunch of, like, things that Kojima loves and he just sort of rolled them into, into video games. So, I mean, watch The Rock and then imagine that Ed Harris is a big robot or your clone brother, which, whichever. It's really just any of the above. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's a movie we watched recently that we, we enjoyed. Uh, like we said, top of the show, it was kind of a slow news week, so we were just like, what do we talk about on the show this week? Let's talk about some movies we watched that we really loved. Yeah. Uh, we watch a lot of movies. We love them. Uh, one of the sort of, I don't know, downsides at IGN is we always focus on the big, huge blockbuster stuff because that does well. We talk about Spider-Man. We talk about Deadpool. We talk about the DC stuff. But we don't get a chance to talk about the weird, smaller things that more often than not, we wind up completely falling in love with. So we wanted to recommend to you guys some stuff that maybe went under your radar. Yeah. Starting with The Void, which is coming to Netflix, I believe, ne next week. Uh, this is a bizarre indie horror movie that came kind of out of nowhere. Um, it's creepy as hell. Uh, it's got its roots very firmly in kind of John Carpenter stuff, and it's got just awesome practical effects. Yeah, it's it's very um, fascinating from a premise perspective because it sort of acts as a sequel to a horror movie that you've never seen because they never made it. When the characters start off in this movie, they're in peril and you it only gets worse from there. Uh, to me, it reminds me of a lot of sort of 90s vintage horror video games, like stuff like Resident Evil, stuff like uh, Silent Hill, stuff that's sort of like mm -hmm. contained horror in a weird place where things only get weirder and weirder, there's no explanation, and it's just grim, yep. visceral, and disgusting. Yep. And I love this movie. Um, I was a little originally sort of like, you know, kind of weirded out by the fact that they were leaning so heavily into that kind of Stranger Things, la neon laser yeah, gray aesthetic. It's, it's got but a very, it's, very it's really not about that. But yeah. no, it's and it's just it's cool. Stop showing it. Everyone go watch it. It's on Netflix next week. Uh, what's not on Netflix just yet, but probably will be eventually, is a movie called Raw that I yeah. just saw. You can watch uh, all these movies on yeah. either rent them or, or buy them or whatever you yeah. want through Amazon, uh, through Netflix. All that I else. think I rented Raw through uh, Amazon. It is a French movie. Um, let's see. How do I describe this? It is a French kind of coming of age movie about veterinarian school that also involves cannibalism and it's just revolting. Yes. It has some of the most like, without doing the thing where it's just, it's, I would say it's quality over quantity of gore. Uh, there's definitely a lot of it, but the way it's presented is the, is the kind of thing that's just, just disgusting. Yeah, and some of you may have seen you. the trailer for this be playing before Logan. I know Max and I did, and I, I, we were all just sort of gasping in the theater, being like, what is this? Yeah. And I, I kept saying to myself, like, when's a good time to watch this? Because I want to make sure that, you know, I can pay full attention to it. I don't know if I want to see it in the theater with a cheeseburger or anything like that. But yeah, this is uh, very, very different than any other movie I've seen in the last few years. It's not necessarily a horror movie, although it does have those elements, and it's not necessarily a zombie movie, although it does have those elements too. It's, yeah, just, I mean, we're already, I think, saying too much, but it's just, it's incredibly stylized. Uh, you know, full warning, it is it is subtitled, so if that's, a, if that's a deal breaker for you, you might want to pass, but it's just like, it's just upsetting, it, yeah. but in like a really cool way. So check that out. Killer soundtrack too. Yeah, it's it's sort of yeah. sexy and disgusting at the same time. It's that's French. Impossible. It's French. Um, so yeah, on the subject of eating people, why would we not stop talking about that? Bone Tomahawk is another one. This came out. Welcome to IGN's top five cannibal yeah. movies. No, uh, Bone Tomahawk came out about two years ago. It's got Kurt Russell and a bunch of other great actors in it. And uh, inclu including uh, Matthew Fox from Lost. It was really interesting oh. to see him in a movie again. So the premise here is that uh, a stranger shows up to town having done something horrible and pissing off an entire group of cannibals who now take vengeance on this town by kidnapping a woman, taking her out into the uh, Lost Woods, and these four characters have to go and find her. Huh. Uh, doing that back in the day with limited weaponry and no iPhone uh, is a terrifying prospect. Many of them say goodbye to their wives and head out into the night. And what from happens from there uh, is a really interesting, very sort of violent take on classic westerns. Yeah. We've gotten a lot of westerns in the last few years, like, you know, that have worked in some ways and haven't in others. But this is a, a movie that you almost definitely didn't see. It's on Amazon Prime streaming, so if you already pay for that to get your, you know, your 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 package. I looked it up. I don't know if it's still on Prime, but it's you can rent it. It's No, I just watched it like oh, 3 days ago. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Well, good. 
Um, so, yeah, also, if you're hyped for Red Dead Redemption, this is a pretty safe bet to, yeah. if you're looking at something that maybe explores the more gruesome side of the Wild West. Yeah, um, it's also a much more violent and disgusting take on the sort of cowboys and Indians thing, because they very early say, uh, this is not Indians, this is a cannibalistic tribe of animal monster right. people. So wow, okay. go check that so, out. Yeah, you're going to love it. Go watch it. Uh, yeah. Speaking of uh, monster people, we just mentioned it, but... Kong, Skull Island. Yeah. Go check it out. If you missed that, it's obviously that's in a, a considerably higher budget category than the rest of these movies, mm -hmm. but like, uh, yeah, that was fun. It was a really good time. Yeah, I, really. I kind of am kicking myself for not seeing it in theaters. Um, I think we're in this spot right now where there are, there are like these kind of art house darlings. I just went and watched uh, Baby Driver last night, which is the, the new movie from uh, um, uh, Edgar Wright. It was, it was cool, but like, I don't know, like, I, I think expectations play a lot of, uh, of what you what you get with movies, and you know, I, I go and I see the big, huge AAA blockbuster Marvel movies, and I go and see the kind of more critically acclaimed stuff, and this fell kind of directly in the middle there. Yeah, um, this was I mean, kind of like a B a B plus of a film, and that's fine. And like, that's monster fine, movies right? are stupid sometimes, and like I think WB is taking their time building the uh, the, the Universal monster. No, not even that. The uh, the, the kaiju Godzilla King of monsters, whatever the hell it's called. Um, but yeah, it's setting up a, a bunch of monsters fighting each other on the big screen, which is cool because like it's not dudes in rubber suits; it's like that stuff. So. Yeah, to me, this this uh, evoked a lot of the same feelings I had the first time watching a movie like Jurassic Park, where there was just like this sense of f fear and wonder around every corner. You would see characters turn and be like, "What is that? Yeah. What like you feel like you're on an adventure with them?" Yeah. And in, in the same sort of sense, you felt playing something like Breath of the Wild or any other kind of big adventure video game. It's really fun, it's full of surprises, um, yeah. and it's just really good to look at. Yeah, so if you're also a big fan of, of guts and special effects and things, and uh, I don't know, you don't want to pay any money for anything, uh, check out what Neil Blomkamp's doing. He's uh, started this thing called Oats Studios. Uh, they're on YouTube, it's just oats, like the breakfast, I don't know where mm -hmm. my, Or like oh, a horse, a horse's yeah, food. Yeah, horse's favorite food studios. Uh, and there are two shorts he put up, they're like 20 minute long, kind of, somewhere between a, a short film, an episode of something, and uh, one of them is called Raka, and the other one's called Firebase. I haven't watched Firebase yet, but Raka is about, uh, it's, if I had to totally break it down, it feels like Terminator, but with psychic lizard people instead of robots. And yeah, it, I'm in. It's pretty cool. Uh, what's really interesting is these are free, and they're like, they're gorgeous, like, big budget looking sci-fi monster movie things. Uh, and he's got like a donation link, so if you really love it, you can go kick him a few bucks. Uh, I think he's gonna be putting them out on Blu-ray as like a collection type of thing. Even weirder, he's selling the 3D assets used to make these on Steam, which is something that no one's ever done before. So if you were the kind of person who makes movies for fun, or you make games, or I don't even know how you do this, it's a few bucks to get an incredibly high resolution render of that guy, or a zombie or whatever. Yeah, so I love seeing stuff like that from creators. There was a couple years ago, uh, Trent Reznor put all the sort of like, uh, just stacked versions of his songs out and they're like, he's like, remix them. Take my assets, take the stems yeah. and just tear them apart. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's nice to see Neil, Neil Blomkamp doing that. I mean, at one point he was attached to doing a Halo movie. I don't know. Maybe he'll get thrown at something something really cool and big again. I mean, he's, I think his, I think Chappie's sort of disappointed at the box office, but like, it's a cool ass movie. Everyone's like, "Oh, yeah. Chappie's stupid." It's like, yeah. Compared to what? Like, go see like the Despicable Me Three, you goon. Go watch Short Circuit. That's yeah. a stupid movie. Yeah. Anyway, um, sorry, I got I got real worked up. I really like Chappie. Uh, we talked a bit about the uh, yeah the, the, the Super NES classic. Yep. Um, one of the big surprises out of E3 that Nintendo also delivered that nobody thought would happen. We're getting a brand new 3DS. Metroid game. Mm -hmm. Brand new with an asterisk because it's a remake of Metroid 2. Uh, Metroid Samus Returns looks incredible. It looks great. I'm excited about this. It's been way too long since we got a proper Metroid game. There's a collector's edition that you have to see because it's just Italian chef kissing his fingers good. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is what the European collector's edition looks like. Speaking of Italian chefs. Yes. Uh, there is that awesome steelbook case which looks like the old Game Boy cart. Why have they not been doing that for like every? That's really, I mean, that's the winner right there, right? That's the thing where you go, oh, that's right, this is a remake that evokes all the nostalgia I have for this game. I still have that cart in my apartment. Like, that case is awesome. This little Morph Ball keychain yep. is really cool. Uh, there's a pin and then a CD because someone at Nintendo still thinks that we have CD players. Which most yeah. of us don't. And shout out to the guy in the comments who's like, I have a CD player and I still, okay, that's awesome, man. We, I don't know. I, like, we can stream this stuff, whatever. Uh, and then there's a nice little art book. 
with to go with your I, I I just want like a I want like a Hyrule Historia of Metroid stuff at this oh, point. Oh dude, I would love that. Uh, I would love but yeah, that. so this is awesome. If you live in Europe, congratulations. Not only do you have healthcare, you also have cool Metroid collector's editions. Here in America, we're all bleeding from the ears and we get this one. Here, bring it back. Come on. Show it. Show the thing. Please show the They're going to show us. You see we're no, bleeding. No, come from on. Ears. Uh, it's a ghost. We've got ghost there. disease. This is what we get stateside. We all get, right. Oh, but no, look very closely. It's got a you, CD in it. You get you get the CD, which is it's, it's a bunch of Metroid music, which is some of my favorite video game music, period. But like, really? That's it? Yeah, that's it. We, clearly, Metroid has fans. I mean, also, we get there's, there's the cool Amiibo. Why not just, I don't know, maybe bundle it with those Amiibo? Maybe do that, because people who are going to buy the, the Metroid Amiibo that works with this game... Maybe they'd want to buy them all in one place. I don't like. Sell I sell more copies of the game. I don't understand, and this is not just a Nintendo of America thing. Although they sort of historically uh, have been a little lackluster in these departments, but I feel like with video games in general, every single time there's a big sort of tentpole release with a collector's edition or special edition or something like that, there's one region that gets screwed, and there's one other region that gets like a half version of what the other region gets, and it's like, it really sucks, man. Yeah. Like, it really sucks to be like, I want, you know, I want everything that comes with the Breath of the Wild collector's edition. Oh, Japan gets this, Europe gets this, America gets this. Like, you get a hat, you get a map, you get a shirt, you get a pog. Like, Bring it all together. Put your heads together. Get Bust out Google Translate or Babelfish or whatever you need to do to make sure everyone understands what's going on. Pick the coolest stuff and just release it for everybody. Also, we are, we, some, of know, those, some of those designs that like 3DSs and, and Switch cases and stuff that you see in, in Japan, like, why don't we get those? Why don't we get those? Like the entire world is constantly fighting. We are always at war with each other. We hate each other, we're angry, we're pissed off, we're jealous, we're fat and sick. Bring the universe together and let us buy Samus keychains <laughs> and not CDs because I don't have a CD player anymore except for my PS4, ironically, which yeah. is weird. But you, it's just weird. Yeah, you want to listen to Metroid music out of your PS4? Well, that's probably the closest thing you're going to get to Super Metroid on your Vita unless you hack it. Or you play Axiom Verge. Anyway. So anyway, this concludes the part of our show where two adult men shout about how they want keychains that are only available in Europe. But this don't worry, <laughs> it gets worse. So we have a, a pressing issue we need to address. Yeah. Um, if you've seen the film Star Wars Return of the Jedi, you may be familiar with one scene in which Princess Leia, played by Carrie Fisher, meets Wicket W. Warwick, played by Warwick Davis. Let's take a look right here. Here's the scene. They meet. And she gives him like a Luna bar or whatever, whatever it is he eats. It's weird. Yeah. It's like a weird little crispy cruncher, like a handy snack. <laughs> it's just like As a, little, you can a see, little crunch bar. She's wearing uh, some, some fatigues there. She's wearing some, some Rebel Alliance uh, commando pants and some funny boots and everything and a weird hat that mm -hmm. I never understood what that hat actually does. It doesn't seem like a great helmet on the top, but whatever. It's a world full of space wizards, so go figure. Now, if you pay close attention, shortly after this scene, something happens. She goes back to the Ewok village, mm -hmm. and they put her in this dress. They jump from this this outfit to this outfit. Now, we have some uh, very high-end replicas of these two outfits here to take a look at. Yeah. And we have one big question. Do the, do the Ewoks make her the dress? Where does she get this dress? Now, this, this, this question stemmed from a coworker of ours who runs our Snapchat team, Cassidy Moser. We gave her these toys the other day because she's awesome. And we said, awesome people deserve weird Leia figures. Yes. And she said, where did where does she get this dress? She gets changed. No. Now, if she's you, not wearing a backpack. Right. No, if you look closely, you take off the officially Lucasfilm limited licensed action figure of Princess Leia in her uh, indoor commando fatigues. There's no dress underneath there. Yep. Uh, she doesn't have any luggage with her. Or she sandals. Has, look at the sandals. Yeah, no, maybe they're under the, under the boots. But if you look at this, this is like a very nice dress. It's got lots of, like, pleating. It's clearly not made for an Ewok. They don't even wear clothes. They wear weird, smelly hoods. Uh, but they braid her hair. So, so a bunch we, of we got we got to we got to dig into the timeline here. Okay. To see actually how this happens. Because if you've seen Return of the Jedi, which you should, because it's awesome, you'll remember that at one point Chewbacca, Han Solo, C three PO, R two D two, and Luke Skywalker all walk into a net that has a dead moose animal thing in it. Yes. They get pulled up, and then they get kidnapped by Ewoks, put onto sticks so they can get roasted and eaten. And during all of this. Princess Leia, who averts all this nonsense by feeding Wicked a Luna bar, goes, you know what I'm going to do right now while my friends are cooking over open spigots? I'm going to do my hair right. and change my clothes. So let's really get into this. It doesn't really go into too much detail about how much time has elapsed, but clearly a bunch of, there's so many questions. The more questions we answer, the more we have. 
Did did the rebel search party just take their sweet time so Leia gets her hair done and gets a dress made by small bears? Or do Ewoks have incredible tailors, regardless of the fact they don't even wear clothes, who right. make this dress suddenly and they come in with their weird little stubby sausage fingers and braid this woman's long, long hair, which up until now was stuffed up in a helmet, so that probably took some relaxing, I don't know, like nice now, combs. They don't have combs. They don't even have hair. I know what you're thinking. Neither of those men are women, and one of them doesn't have hair. So what do they know? Well, here's the thing. We are handsome and sweet, and we've tricked multiple women into spending time with us over their lives. And I've seen the thing happen, and it's strange, but sometimes you'll sit next to a girl and she'll play with her hair, and moments later, halfway through like an episode of Hannibal or something, she'll have braids. And it's crazy magic that I don't understand because I'm bald, but women can do it. So that explains sure, that. Sure, sure, but, but, again, there's a lot at stake. The Emperor has another battle station bigger than the last, which it's, is being you can constructed. See it. They're trying to shut down the shield generator to protect the galaxy, and there's a bunch of bears who are like making her a dress. What are the priorities here? It doesn't make any sense. Why would bears make women's clothes Wouldn't and she... then kidnap her friends to eat? I it's mean, crazy. Also, do they wash? They don't, like, they're bears who live in tree houses. Are they gonna wash her clothes? They weren't even that dirty. She fell off a bike into a bush. There isn't even a river. Again, also, they use meat to catch a bunch of the search party. Why didn't they just eat the meat? Also, they're catching carnivores. That's like a, that's kind of a, like a weird thing to be, to be hunting, I guess. Wouldn't they take bows out and go after some, like, smaller animal that eats grass? Or, I don't, I don't or. I understand what the Ewoks were doing there. Or, that dress was worn by a woman that they ate. What the f Really, think about that. Dig into that for a second. Yeah. I don't care what time it is. Dig into that, think about that. So anyway. So those little bear men with their weird ho houses and the sticks that they use to kill the robot chicken leg, kill the woman, <laughs> stole her clothes, and put it on a princess while they tried to eat her friends until they got tricked by a robot gold man that they thought was a god. How dare you say that's not a good Star Wars movie? There's, How dare you? There's also so much in that movie that establishes the Ewoks have no problem eating people. And using their heads as drums. But apparently they also make dresses. Yeah, and let's talk about the end of that movie where Lando Calrissian is standing with that one Ewok and he's like, I don't yeah, I'll about sleep it. with you. This I've feels good. I've been hanging out with Neonun in a cockpit all day. Look, we're in the forest moon of Endor. I've been hanging out with a weird little man in a plane for two hours. Yeah. I'll sleep with anything. And Wicket rubs up against Han's leg. That's a weird movie. Unbelievable. You should watch Return of the Jedi again. It's a great time. We're not even talking about the first 20 minutes, and it was weird as hell. Where did you get that dress? We're on to you. <laughs> Wait, yeah. There she is. It's a fetching dress. Also, if you Google image like Endor Leia, there's a lot of people who like to dress up like that and hang out in abandoned buildings. Yeah, I bet their clothes were made by a woman who was dead and eaten by small bears. You never know. The mysteries of Star Wars. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, I'm glad we got that off our chest. I feel really good right now. Yeah, like, really. Man, that was like a workout. Yes, yeah, yeah. that was nothing like a workout. Yeah, was, I know you exercise, but I don't know what that trainer has you doing. It's, well, that's mostly All that. Right. We just talk about Return of the Jedi so, and then I leave. The fine folks at DC Collectibles sent over a beautiful statue that I want to show off now that we're done shouting about Princess Leia's dress. Uh, this is the, uh, what is it, Gotham Garage uh, statue series. Um, they've made a couple of these so far. There is also a Harley Quinn one, which is pretty great because she's got a sidecar full of hyenas. I kind of wish we had that one. But that again, rules. Wonder Woman's okay too, I guess. Uh, so the whole idea here is it's, you know, they get cool artists to be like, hey, what would it be like if Wonder Woman had like an invisible motorcycle? Um, and it's, it's you know, it comes in like a few pieces. This thing will run you $350. Why it's does a high-end statue. Why does she come off of it? So that they can put her in a box and ship it to re retailers. Oh, because she can't, she can't, what so is she, just like sleep? You could totally probably put her on all kinds of different stuff. Also, check out the weird dent that, there's like a dent in her butt so she Harvey can lean dent. up again. <laughs> yes, this is the Harvey dent. Cool slang for a bu the butt cheek. The old, old two-face, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, there's a fun little helmet that doesn't actually go on her. You just hang it from the handlebars. <laughs> this is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> I like how Alana's like, hey, can you unbox this on Up at Noon? I'm going to take photos of it later, but I don't, I don't have time to shoot a full unboxing. But we got you covered. We'll yeah. totally handle this. But while we're there, we're going to come up with cool new <laughs> slang for the human butt, and that's the Harvey Dent toothpaste. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, they uh, they hired somebody to design new tattoos for her, which is weird because Wonder Woman doesn't even... Stop, 
look at the statue, please. I'm crying. I know you're crying. Oh my god. Who's crying? Do you think do you think Two Face's butt is like one half is is all like fire burned and the other half is just a normal man's butt? It's gotta be, right? Maybe. maybe. I mean, that's a good question. I don't think his whole I don't think his whole body's like that. Let's dig into that. I mean, no, don't. Let's not dig into that. Yeah, let's butt. dig into Harvey Dent's butt cheeks. He's got it. I mean, half of his half of his body went into the vat, right? There was. Okay, let's move on. Again, this will run you three hundred and fifty dollars. It's an edition of twenty five hundred. It's uh, almost fourteen inches wide. It weighs quite a bit. I almost don't want to break it there, but yeah, it comes off the base. Uh, it comes shipped in a big old box. So uh, you know, consult your local comics retailer if that's the thing that gets your attention. If three hundred and fifty bucks is not in the budget. Uh, Head down to your local Walmart because there are a bunch of little tiny minifigs that are coming out. Um, these are called nano figs, nano metal figs, and they're little die cast. Uh, nano miniatures. metal. Nano metal, exactly. It's what the T1000 is made out of. There we um, go. But these are an exclusive at Walmart uh, for, I think it's through August 1st, and then I imagine they'll be available elsewhere. Um, these are like, I mean, they're they're like goofy little collectible toys. They're super cheap. The single figures are 90, 94 cents, I think. So with tax, probably comes out to a buck. Kind of weird to find anything that costs a buck in twenty seventeen. Um, but they're doing um, they're doing Harry Potter. So you got Newt Scamander, and you've got Harry Potter. Or what is it? There we go. Harley here's, Quinn. Here's, here's a little Rocket Raccoon. Yeah, that's your man um, right there. So yeah, the paint ops on these aren't super fancy. Again, they're like a buck each. It's it's five bucks for the five pack. Checks out. Um, but there's, if you're, you know, the kind of person who does tabletop gaming and paints miniatures, this could totally be something worth repainting. You know? I was going to say, you know what these are perfect for? Monopoly. Yeah, yeah, totally. Get rid of that thimble and that car and the man. Yeah, or if you play other other board games, you know, that's, also that's Monopoly. Option. Yeah, um, but yeah, the these old are... old-timey good game about I love that these stealing are, the town. These are just like, they're just, they're, they're straight up like tin soldiers, you know? Mm -hmm. They're like little, little old-fashioned, the, the original action figure really was, you know, lead soldiers, but... Um, yeah, check them out if you're, you know, at a Walmart and you want a small Spider-Man to, I don't know, put on your car, whatever you, wherever you put something like that. I don't oh, know like, you, like a Bentley? Yeah, if you want to put like a hood ornament, you're like, <laughs> yeah, get a Bentley and then go down to Walmart and get a 94 cent figurine of Cyborg and just solder that on the tip there so they people love that. know that you've got money, but also... Not afraid to have a little fun. That's that Groot is very weird. Yeah, the Groot's kind of funky. Yeah, these it's are like cool. Gold. I feel like this is a good thing. Like if you have a kid uh, and he's acting up, acting a fool in, in Walgreens. Yeah. You got a dollar and that'll shut him up. Yeah. We got any uh, we got any hot questions for the chat or anything? I don't know. Everything stopped working. Oh yeah. So that's why we started talking about Harvey Dent's butt. That's true. Who is who is no, this? No, really though. I don't know who this is. This is like I think it's like the Griff. Oh, it's Marcus. Right. It's Marcus Flint. It's the captain of the Slytherin Quidditch team. That's I don't like even a know what, I've, I've only cut. seen the first Harry Potter movie, and I saw it with you. Yeah, I don't think he even it. shows up in there. The other the other day was the 20th anniversary of Harry Potter, and everybody was tweeting about it, and it was it was the closest I felt to being like a guy who can't read. Yeah. Where it was just like everyone was talking about this great thing that they had memories of, and I was like, not me. I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean Harry Potter's. It's it's. It's kind of a, a love it or leave it thing. Like mm -hmm. I grew up reading those books. I love them. I've read them all like a bunch of times. I watched the movies all last year. Uh, the movies are completely hit or miss. Um, I think they kind of started to figure out towards the end there. But like, that's a movie that that's a movie series that should have been done um, either as like an HBO show, like Game of Thrones, or like Lord of the Rings, and they should have given like one director the, the opportunity to be like, here's you plan out the whole thing. But I don't think they were ready for that, so they were like, yeah. Chris Columbus, the guy who did Home Alone, do the first two, and the, se the second one is like not great. And that's like my favorite book, so like I was hoping that'd be real cool. Third one, uh, they got the guy who did um, oh, what's his name? Uh, he did uh, Children of Men and Gravity. Uh, Quaron. Uh, Quaron, yeah, uh, and it's uh, it's awesome. It's gorgeous. That's the first movie where they were like, maybe you don't have to put everything in the book on screen. Maybe just make a movie that's rooted in that stuff. I've got a question from the audience. If if Brian could direct a horse kaiju movie, what would it be called? Oh. If, so the question is, if Brian could direct a horse kaiju movie, what would it be called? What, who's this from? This is from Easterly Art. And this is oh, hi, Easterly Art. Easterly Art, you should all follow him on Instagram. Yeah, he, he made, fantastic a, stuff. made these stickers. He made our stickers. Yeah. Um, a horse kaiju movie. That's actually really upsetting because most kaiju, I feel like, are either... Uh, I mean, I feel like they're mostly either they got a ton of legs or they're like humanoid. They kind of walk. I mean, because there were traditionally people in suits, but you don't see like a just a big horse just stomping around, kicking stuff over. Right. 
Maybe they should do like a big, like a Paul Bunyan movie where it's a kaiju fight between just a huge lumberjack and like a blue ox, but they're like wrecking San Francisco. I think he's gotta be on all four feet too. Oh, of course. No, yeah. I don't wanna see a horse walking around on two legs. That's no. awful. One thing we, that I noticed that I didn't wanna talk about before, before the show went off the rails and now I can because here we are. Yeah, we're, we're totally off the rails. Um, King Kong doesn't really have a schwanz, does he? I think it probably gets like sucked up in his body cavity like a dolphin's. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to give one more shout out to uh, a Twitter account that you should follow called Nintendeal. They tweeted out the other day that this little man was only $13 on Walmart, so I bought him for our desk. Look at that gut. Look at that. I'm trying to work that thing off. Mario's just owning it. I kind of love him he for doesn't, that. He doesn't care. No, he, he does, does not care. care. He eats pasta and booze all that. I like that you can just like, you can, uh, you, can't really, you can't really pose his legs a whole That's lot. It's how his legs go out. You can yeah. just... Sort his of. arms go up and his head turns. He so looks yeah, like shout out to Nintendo Deal. Yeah, this is great. Follow them, they'll probably help you get yeah. a Super Nintendo They classic. might also have a deal on baby carriers, so if you want to look like a certified lunatic, you can put them on the front of you and then go shop around at the store. Go down to the baby aisle, be like, my boy needs some, some mashed mushrooms. He needs some little, little chewy boys. He loves to eat the mushrooms. And they'll kick you out of Safeway. They won't let you do that in there. That's really not gonna pass, not gonna fly. No good. Anyway, that was Stop up being in being a single dad. The weirdest show on the internet, hands down. I mean, that's not like no, not really. With sex stuff. Don't even say that. Yeah. Well, we did talk about. It's definitely the weirdest show on IG. It's the weirdest show on IGN. Oh, by a million yeah. miles. Uh, I'm Brian. That's Max. That was our show every Thursday at 12 p.m. Pacific time here at IGN. We make this show. It's not the only show we make. We're also on Nintendo Voice Chat every week. We're on Podcast Beyond. We have a new episode of Link Together going up today. There's Unlocked. There's Fire Team Chat. There's the, uh, just a billion things. We just make shows here nonstop. Game Wheel, Cube, Wheel of, of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune is a great show you can watch with your grandpa. Sorry, were we listing shows in general or IGN shows? Geo Party. It's <laughs> <laughs> not how it's pronounced at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, quick heads up: we will not have it up at noon next week yeah. because it is what are the two like forty percent of the week is holidays and Uncle Sam's explosion anniversary yeah. day. They're, they said they were going to fill the studio with smoke. I don't know what yeah. that means, but they said don't go in there. It's gonna be full of smoke, so don't use it. No up at noon next week. Yeah, uh, um, next next Wednesday is the National uh, Finger Sacrifice Day for people who hold M80s. So they're going to blow up some hands. Yeah, hopefully not yours. I have a I have a different celebration. I do stuff with small small swords. Yeah, so that's how I do my finger sacrifice. Yeah, I think that we got it. We got it. We should probably go. Uh, but yeah, uh, we won't be on next week. But uh, good news is we are going to be at San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. Yeah. So uh, we'll do fun stuff there. It's gonna be great. They have they, their whole that whole show floor looks like our desk. It's full of toys. And remember, you can now call your butt a Harvey Dent. <laughs> You're welcome. Good night. Let's all go to the lobby, let's all go to the lobby.